know, God's word is something that it's very easy to take for granted, the Bible. It's, it's very easy. Just, you know, we live here in America. You can go down to Walgreens and, and pick up a Bible. You could be standing in line at the giant eagle and there's a Bible right there for you to purchase, or at least a New Testament. It's very accessible to us. And it's hard to imagine that around the world there are, are people who do not have access to a Bible. It's inconceivable to me that, that there are parts of the world where having a Bible is against the law, where missionaries and where people are, are killed for trying to give God's word to someone. The Bible, I I remember in college, I went to hear a speaker at an event and it was noted that he was um, a former prisoner of war. And this is, you know, college, 25 years ago for me. So, you know, I I didn't know what war was. My my generation did not experience either end of the wars that were in there, that, that those years there. And so he's talking about this war, then he started talking about his experience of being a prisoner of war and in his cell. The one thing that kept he and his fellow prisoners uh, of war um, together was this certain amount of scratches and notches and dinks that they put, they would do against the wall as word for word, letter for letter, they would recite to each other the letters of the New Testament and some of the gospels of the New Testament for what they knew to to spur each other on to survival. I know in seminary, when I went to um, a Bible study at the church that I was serving, Dr. Langford was um, leading a Bible study in the Gospel of John, and here, you know, he's one of the world's most renowned scholars on John, and it took me only a few seconds to realize that even though his Bible was opened, he wasn't reading from his Bible. He, he was reading from his heart. God's word had been written upon his heart. And I know there are probably many of you who have, who know people in your lives that that the power of God comes through the Bible, through them in so many different ways. Because God's word is power and it is life-giving when proclaimed and lived. The word of God has been gifted to us so that we might know more, know more fully and how deeply we are loved by God. The word of God has been gifted to us so that we might gain knowledge of who we are, so that we might gain some, some wisdom on how to live these earthly lives, how to live these lives with God, and how to live these lives with one another, so that we might receive healing and power and strength and life. You know, and as accessible as the Bible is, with as many people that we have in our lives or our testimony, to God's power through the Bible, sometimes we don't get the gift. We come to church and we don't hear this healing power and we don't hear the strength and the life that God's word gives. I think it's because sometimes, so often when we are telling our story as God's people, we're just picking up in the middle of a story that's in in the middle of a story that's within a story. And, and we, we sit there and we hear it and, and, we, and we, sometimes it makes sense as a story and sometimes we get left hanging um, and sometimes it just leaves this empty feeling inside of us because we're not quite sure what to do with this part of God's word in our life. God's word was meant to give life, to give power and strength, whether it's in a prison cell or in a Bible study or in a church pew. And now the scriptures that Jeff read just a few minutes ago from Acts 3 does just that. It picks up in the middle of a story that's in the middle of a story that's within a story. And so I feel that before I, I, let, before I begin talking about verses 12 through 19, I need to back up and just give you a little bit of a background um, for the words that Peter begins to, to pro- proclaim Because there is a powerful, powerful healing that happens at the beginning of chapter 3 in Acts. Okay, to set the time frame here, this story begins after Pentecost, shortly after Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit comes and rests upon all the believers in the risen Christ and empowers them to live lives to the fullest. 
that God is with them in a new way. The church was born. Church didn't quite look like we think it looks. There weren't any pews, there were no crosses in the sanctuaries or anything like that, but the church was born. And Peter and John, who were faithful disciples of Jesus, they had followed Jesus for three years, from town to town, from community to community. They'd seen the miracles and the healings and and the feeding of the 5,000. They've heard Jesus teach the parables and they asked Jesus questions. They shared a meal with Jesus for three years. Three years, Peter and John were followers of Jesus. Before the arrest, before the trial, before the condemnation, before the crucifixion, and even before the resurrection, Peter and John were followers of Jesus. And they have now begun their missionary journeys to transform the world through the power and through the love of Jesus Christ. And one day, Peter and John were walking up to temple to go to the hour of prayer. And this is when all devout Jews went to temple to pray And they gave alms at the temple as well. And before he entered the temple, there was this this gate that was to a big courtyard, sort of made a a sanctuary and a safe place for the buildings inside. And this particular gate that Peter and John were walking up to was known as the beautiful gate. And all faithful Jews passed through the beautiful gate each day as they came and arrived for prayer. But now this gate was also a place where the lame, the blind, the professional beggars of the day would come and they would receive alms, they would receive money from those going in to the temple. And there was one man in particular this day that we hear about as Peter and John approached the temple. And every day, every day, people saw this man at the beautiful gate. I don't know how he got there, he was lame. Perhaps family or friends carried him to the gate because begging was how he made a living. And that sounds strange, but it was an accepted practice for someone who was lame. It was an expected practice for someone who was lame or unable to make a living. It was expected for them to live off the mercy of those going to temple. And every day, this one particular man was seen and was given alms by those who passed by. And then this man saw Peter and John. And the lame beggar asked them for alms. And Peter and John looked intently at him, perhaps even looking him in the eyes, which this this soul looking was probably a little different for this man, for this beggar, because he was used to being invisible. He was used to people passing by and doing their duty by giving him some a coin. But the man, being obedient, because that was part of the way he lived his life, to be obedient to those that were coming, he was did as he is told, and he looked up to Peter and John, expecting to receive some some coins for his obedience. But Peter, Peter said to him, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And Peter held out his hand, and this man took his hand, and for the first time in his life, he was standing on his feet. He felt power and healing flowing through his body as he regained strength in his ankles and he learned how to balance in a second. Could you imagine feeling that go through your body? Something that was so ordinary for so many people to feel the power and the healing flow into your body. He walked with Peter and John into the temple. No, he didn't walk, he was leaping. He was leaping for joy. He was praising God for what had happened. And people were gathering in the portico entrance and they were utterly astonished at what they were seeing with their own eyes. And this is where we pick up God's word today. The healing at the gate had already happened and Peter and John were walking into temple with the lame beggar who was leaping for joy, praising God. And like moths to the light, people are drawn to this healing. Something 
something out of the ordinary has disrupted their very ordinary, normal lives. In the name of Jesus, the lame beggar had been healed and people saw it. They saw what had happened. And they come. People come perhaps because they're curious at what they've heard. They don't believe it and they need to see it themselves. Perhaps they're coming because they are in need of healing in their own lives. Or maybe they need a miracle, a healing for someone that they know in their lives. And they're looking for that. Or maybe they're looking for an explanation as to why the healing happened. Maybe they don't know why they are standing there watching this lame man leap for joy and praise God. Maybe they don't even know how they got there. But there they are standing in awe and amazement at what has happened. Now, Peter and John begin to notice the gathering crowds. I mean, who wouldn't? They're coming. They're coming to see. And the faces on the, of the crowd must have given their hearts away, for the crowds did not see God's power of salvation. Peter and John see that human hearts were horrifically wrong in their understanding. The first thing that went horrifically wrong in the understanding was that the crowds misunderstood the source of healing. At first glance, the crowds know what they know. They know they saw this man begging for alms every day by the beautiful gate. And now they know that they see this man leaping for joy, praising God. And they saw or they heard that Peter and John had talked to this man. And so in their minds, it makes the most amount of sense for them to believe that Peter and John must be the source of the healing. And people have always had this, this hunger to believe that some people can tap into the, the power of the universe to bring wholeness to our lives it is far easier to believe that it was because of some power a person had to heal than to believe that God, the God who created the universe, would come into their life and heal like that. So often we look for a reason for miracles not to be of God. How amazing how amazing it is that crowds that gather even today have not changed their thought pattern very much. And so Peter addresses the crowds and says, why do you stare at us like we did this? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus. Peter quickly tries to set the story straight. He tells everyone that it is because that, that, that it is of the God who created that this happened. Peter reminds everyone who has entered through the gate that their God has done this. He totally takes the glory that's been given to him and he deflects it and he puts it back on God to where it belongs. The second thing, that Peter and John realize is that the people misunderstood the nature of life with God. Now remember, the crowds lived in a world where brokenness was the rule and healing was the exception. Remember, these crowds were very, very close to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They do not live in a world where there are New Testament writings for them to talk about or to read. There is no Sunday school class that gathers to talk about the latest parable that Jesus taught. There, there are no tweets, there is no social media that can share the news that God indeed loves us. There, there is no Holy Week that people come to, to remember the suffering and the sacrifice that Jesus made. Communion is not shared the first Sunday of every month so that we can remember how much we are loved by God. Having a risen Savior is a very new thing in their world. 
Having a God who lives with us every day, having a God who is for us, who walks with us and talks with us along life's narrow way, tends to be the exception to the rule, not the norm. You know, it's amazing how much we think we have changed, but we really haven't. How, how easy it is to live life as if God was with us. It was the exception. How easy it is to walk through our days forgetting all that Jesus has done for us. Peter reminds the crowds of just what has happened. Jesus was handed over and the crowds had rejected him in the presence of Pilate for a murderer. The crowds killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. Peter urges the crowd to remember they were witnesses to all that had happened, that Peter and John were witnesses, that all of us were witnesses to what had happened. Remember? Remember when Jesus came into town with shouts of celebration? Remember everything changed. Jesus was arrested, he was tried, he was crucified. Jesus died, was put in a tomb, it was sealed, guarded, but Jesus broke through the tomb. The seal could not hold him, and Jesus lives again. Many have seen Jesus. Many have witnessed and talked with Jesus. They've shared a meal on the beach with Jesus. Peter and John have seen him. Many have seen him, and the world is different now. God's purpose of restoring all the earth has been completed in Jesus. God is not only a God of creation, but God is a God of recreation every day. The third thing that was misunderstood by the crowds was that healing called for only astonishment and awe and wonder. That gathering to witness what has happened was enough. That somehow just seeing the lame man leap for joy was enough. And Peter finishes this mini-sermon in Acts chapter 3 by acknowledging that he knows it's only out of the ignorance of the crowds and their rulers that the crowds didn't know how to fully respond to the healing. And the crowds really have not changed that much at all. From one generation to the next, we have not changed at all. Something happens in our world, a tragedy or a celebration, and like moths to the flame, we are drawn to the beautiful gate, to the sacred space, to see what God is doing. After 9-11, churches all across America were filled to the brim with worshipers. We witnessed prayers and and coming together and we were in awe of how people came together. Every Christmas Eve, churches all around the world are filled with friends and with family and we sing Silent Night and we find hope that God has chose to be with us again. Every Easter, church parking lots, there can be a few arguments, but every Easter church parking lots are filled, every space is filled because we come and sing hallelujah and we are amazed again at what Jesus has done. We gather, we gather much like the crowds that gather that at that gate and our response falls so short. But Peter says, repent, therefore, and turn to God so your sins might be wiped out. Peter tells us it's not just to come enough to come and see. Turn your life around. Turn to God. Run to God in all that you do. We are the crowd just coming and seeing, just coming and being amazed is not enough. Repent, turn around so your sins can be wiped out. Peter gives us a simple word 
And no matter how much of God's word we hear at a time, the word is still the same. God loves you. This is proven in Jesus Christ. Repent. Turn to God. Run to God so that your sins are wiped away. Our response. I have a quote by Thomas G. Long. It's on the back of your bulletin. And I challenge you to look at that this week and remember this quote. In the face of God's deeds of mercy all around us, we are summoned not merely to say how wonderful, but to turn around, to repent, to change our citizenship, and to become a faithful part of God's work in the world. Amen. And amen. Let us pray. Almighty and grace giving God, we read stories in your word about healings and about salvation. And sometimes, God, it um, leaves our response a little weak. And so we pray, Lord, that when we hear the truth of salvation, when we hear that our sins are wiped away, we would stand in awe and wonder. But we pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in our response and that our faith would grow stronger each and every day and that our response would be one that helps us to leap for joy, to praise your name, and to let others know that you are a God of recreation. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.